regardless of how you believe things will play out when Yeshua returns. He gave the instructions to pray we escape it all. This is Off the Cuff, and I'm Steve from TorahFamily.org. Let's talk about it. A quick FYI to all the prophecy students. You may want to play this at 1.5 or even 2x speed. Okay, let's begin. In Luke 21, 36, Yeshua instructed us to pray we escape all that's to come. It's what some call the prayer of escape. It reads, Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Now, there are several ways this can be read, and we'll look at those a little later. But what would this escape look like? For some, it's the pre-trib resurrection, what some refer to as the rapture. For others, it's escaping out to the wilderness and being divinely protected. Both views have verses to support their perspective. But what if both are right and yet still kind of wrong? Here's the thing. In the prayer to escape all that is coming, we see we're also to pray we stand before the Son of Man. That's marriage language for the marriage covenant. In the covenant under Moses, we see here in Exodus 19.17 and Deuteronomy 4.11, they all stood before Yahweh at the foot of the mountain for that marriage covenant. They stood before him. It was here when they all said, We will, as seen here in Exodus 24, 7. It's here by way of this covenant when Yahweh became their husband, as seen here in Isaiah 54, verse 5. And likewise, we're now waiting for the marriage covenant just the same as seen here in Revelation 19:6 to be a part of the wedding of the Lamb, the marriage covenant, the new covenant as prophesied here in Jeremiah 31. And it's also seen here in Ezekiel 36. Plus, it's also prophesied here in Hosea chapter 2. It's here in Hosea 2 where we see the Gentiles are grafted into this covenant by way of the wild animals. Thus, the vision Peter saw in Acts 10, and as foretold through Noah's ark with all the clean and unclean animals being saved at the flood. But here's the thing. The coming new marriage covenant, as noted here in Revelation 19, comes immediately after the destruction of Babylon. The destruction of Babylon is seen in the previous chapter, chapter 18. After this destruction, we see the bride getting ready for the marriage covenant here in Revelation 19:6 through 8. This is where I believe we see a lot of confusion come from those trying to understand the timing. Many assume the timing of Babylon's destruction takes place at the end of the tribulation. However, Babylon's destruction actually happens just before the rule of the Antichrist. We see here in Revelation 17, the beast and the ten horns will hate Babylon, the prostitute, and destroy her. This enables the beast and the ten horns to rise to power in her stead. Please remember, as I've noted before, the ten horns represent the ten tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel. They're seen earlier in Revelation 13. It's the beast that comes out of the sea, meaning coming out of the nations. Then we see the two-horned beast coming out of the land also in Revelation 13. This beast with the two horns represent the two tribes of the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin. Thus, the enemy tries to bring unity to the twelve tribes of Israel in the land, but it's under the false messiah. It's the false reunification of the two sticks coming back together as prophesied in Ezekiel 37. But from what we see in Revelation 17, it appears the beast will already be on the scene at the beginning with the seals and may even begin ruling. But as long as Babylon is in existence, the beast will not have full control. 
So, the beast doesn't rise to full power until Babylon is taken out. Thus, we see the plot to take Babylon out in Revelation 17. Verse 17 here shows it's Yahweh who puts it into their hearts to do this. And we see here in chapter 18 that it's Babylon who brings hard times on the people of Yahweh before the beast even rises to full power. Thus, everything up to this point is the first five seals with the destruction of Babylon taking place at the moment of the great earthquake of the sixth seal, the moment of the resurrection. Knowing we see this group taken for the wedding of the Lamb at the destruction of Babylon in Revelation, it would imply the resurrection takes place just moments, if not milliseconds, before Babylon's destruction. I mean, who's going to miss a few hundred thousand from the resurrection when millions, if not billions of people go missing from a global earthquake and the destruction of Babylon at the same time? And this destruction of Babylon opens up the way for the Antichrist to begin his rule. But again, Revelation 18 makes it clear that Babylon has its share in persecuting believers before the resurrection. Before. And this is why we see Yeshua's instruction to pray we escape all that is coming. It'll be a time of persecution, great persecution, under the Babylonian system. Thus, we see the martyrs in the fifth seal. We see the call to come out of Babylon right before it's destroyed in Revelation 18.4. Now, many use this verse to say we should leave Babylon by way of getting out of the cities now. But this call here in Revelation 18 is actually the voice of the archangel at the time of the resurrection, calling all believers to Yeshua. This is seen in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. That's why we see all the believers rejoicing in heaven. They were just taken out of Babylon before its destruction. Yeshua's last command to his disciples was to go into all the world and make disciples. You can't be a light to the world if you're fleeing to the wilderness prematurely. The time will come when he gives us the sign to flee beforehand. Thus, we're to escape all that is coming. But that happens at the sign to flee. We'll cover more on that in a moment. But what about those who missed the resurrection and will have to go through the tribulation under the Antichrist? This will be the five foolish virgins. The door will be shut, leaving them behind. They'll have to go through the tribulation as a time of refinement. They miss out on the escape of the Babylonian persecution and the resurrection. We need to remember, as noted in our teaching, before the harvest, the resurrection is likened to a harvest. That being said, please consider the instructions here in Leviticus 23 when one is harvesting. It says we're not to reap the corners of our fields. Now, please consider the end time parallel. Notice how Yeshua will send out his angels at the end of the tribulation to gather his elect from the four winds. So, where are the four winds at? As we see here in Revelation 7-1, they're at the four corners of the earth. And the earth is the field as seen here in Revelation 14-15. Revelation 14 is where we see the harvest taking place. But here in Matthew 24, Yeshua is showing us the end of the tribulation is the time for the gathering of the gleanings from the four corners. It's the time after the tribulation. The harvest, the resurrection, happens near the start. It's after the tribulation when the gleanings are collected from the four corners, showing us that Yeshua is keeping the Torah all the way through. Also, notice in the Matthew 24 account that the moon doesn't give any light at this time. At the sixth seal, the time of the earthquake and the resurrection, the moon turns to blood. So, we see a distinction between the two events. 
the moon turns to blood at the sixth seal for the resurrection near the beginning. The moon isn't even seen when everything comes to a close. So Matthew 24, 29 through 31 is not discussing the resurrection. It's the gleanings from the four corners. Now, where do we see this from in the prophets? It's in Isaiah 66, at the time of the second exodus. The second exodus is seen here in Isaiah 66, verses 19 and 20. As I've noted before, the whole chapter of Isaiah 66 takes us from the start of the end times to the end. It begins with the abominable sacrifices in the start of the chapter, to the end of the chapter with the second exodus of those who are gathered from the four corners of the earth. For more on this, you can see our teaching, the second exodus. The harvest, the resurrection, takes place at the earthquake of the sixth seal. The sixth seal triggers the trumpet judgments. Then, after the tribulation is done, the gleaners come behind and gather those who had to go through the tribulation. Isaiah even says they're brought in as grain offerings. Grain offerings are just that, offerings, that which is given after what is commanded. These will be those who went through the tribulation but did not undergo the wrath. They will begin their journey to Jerusalem for the second exodus. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there will come a time when we receive the call to flee. The time when the ten virgins are awakened and told to go out to meet him. Until that time, we remain the light to the world around us. But the more I study and pray on this, I sincerely believe this is the time to escape all that is about to happen. Those who make it out will escape the events of the first five seals as they wait for the resurrection. The five wise virgins, then the five foolish virgins, will find themselves under persecution from Babylon, and then, if they're still alive, persecution from the Antichrist. So, the question is, do you pray what Yeshua instructed us to pray? The prayer of escape. I mean, he instructed us to pray this. So, do we? In many of our teachings, I've mentioned how history is cyclical, but not always identical. And just as Yahweh gave Noah a seven-day warning and Lot a one-day warning, I sincerely believe he will give his people, in the end, a warning of what's about to happen just the same. Thus, the wake-up call to the ten virgins. The question has always been, how much in advance will that warning be? When we look at the book of Ezekiel, there's an indication that it could be as long as a 40-day warning. However, this whole 40-day time frame may not be designated as the warning. It's most likely just what happens at the beginning of those 40 days is what's appointed to be the warning sign. And, as you see, it's regarding Jerusalem being surrounded. For what it's worth, we need to understand these verses here in Ezekiel are what Yeshua is referencing when he teaches the disciples regarding Jerusalem being surrounded. But let's be honest here. How many times has Jerusalem been surrounded by its enemies throughout all of history, the last two millennia, or even just the last few centuries? But this goes back to the element of how history is cyclical. Remember, just as Yahweh spoke through Isaiah, he makes known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. But Yeshua gives us the marker that identifies the specific surrounding of Jerusalem that precedes his coming. What marker is that? The surrounding of Jerusalem that includes the abomination that causes desolation. And, for what it's worth, Yeshua is referencing Ezekiel for this as well. In fact, it's in Ezekiel 8 where Ezekiel is shown it for the first time on the fifth day of the sixth month. Now, 
Was it set up the day before and he's shown it up on the fifth day of the sixth month? Or does it get set up on this day? I don't know. Either way, it could very possibly be that on this day in the future, when we see Jerusalem starting to get surrounded, the fifth day of the sixth month. And the abomination that causes desolation will most likely be the reason why Jerusalem gets surrounded this last time around. This is a day I personally believe we should watch every year as it cycles through the calendar. We discussed this topic in our teaching titled, What is the Idol of Jealousy? However, this isn't the only thing that points us to the sixth month for seeing something as a sign to flee for protection. Luke chapter 1 shows Gabriel appeared to Mary in the sixth month. It says she was pledged to be married to Joseph. So, is this a picture of when Yahweh calls for those who are pledged to be married for the new covenant? Now, look at what Mary did after being informed. It says she left in a hurry to the hill country of Judea. What did Yeshua say those in Jerusalem should do when the time comes? To flee to the mountains. Now, where did Mary go? To Zechariah's house. Interestingly enough, the name Zechariah means God remembers. He remembers what? The covenant promise he made to Abraham. It's all about Yahweh remembering the covenant that started with Father Abraham to bring his descendants into the land. And just as he brought them back to the land to make way for Yeshua's first coming, we see in Malachi a similar comparison. Those who fear Yahweh and return to his ways will be written on a scroll of remembrance and spared from the time of the coming trouble. So, there really could be something to seeing the sign to flee taking place in the sixth month. Maybe even the fifth day of the sixth month as Ezekiel was shown. So, from the prophet Ezekiel, we see Jerusalem being surrounded and that for 40 days. We see the abomination that causes desolation coming out in the sixth month. What else is noted in the prophet Ezekiel that many might be missing? Please consider Ezekiel 14, 21. For this is what Sovereign Yahweh says, How much worse will it be when I send against Jerusalem my four dreadful judgments, sword and famine and wild beasts and plague, to kill its men and their animals? Sound familiar? It should. Please consider the horse of the fourth seal, the pale horse. It's the exact same. The verse here in Revelation shows the destruction is not limited to Jerusalem. However, I do believe it starts there. But when we see Jerusalem being surrounded because of the abomination that causes desolation, that will be the sign for the rest of the world that everything is about to start. Those will be the days when the five wise virgins go out to meet him. A big question that remains is, how long will the first five seals last until the time of the earthquake and resurrection of the sixth seal? Will they last during the whole 40 days as given in Ezekiel 4? Up to this point, I've believed Jerusalem is only surrounded during these 40 days, with the 40 days ending with those armies overcoming Jerusalem with the destruction we see in Ezekiel 9. However, the more I pray about it, I believe the 40 days will consist of the four dreadful judgments, sword and famine and wild beasts and plague coming upon Jerusalem. It's not just a siege by only being surrounded. No, it's a siege that begins with them being surrounded, but then being immediately overcome by their enemies. It'll be carried out by what we see in Ezekiel chapter 9, where we see the slaughter of old men, young men, maidens, women, and children. 
But those who have the seal of Yahweh aren't touched because they had already fled to the mountains as Yeshua instructed. It's even possible they simply aren't touched as they're fleeing. This is what I currently lean to. Thus, it would make sense that the first five seals happened to those living in Babylon just the same, bringing the persecution on the believers who didn't escape. And that brings us back to the main topic of this teaching, the prayer of escape in Luke 21, 36. Some translations render it, pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things. However, the word here for able in the Greek carries the connotation of ability by way of strength and not just opportunity. The way it's worded here and in other translations, it gives the feel we should pray we seize the opportunity to escape. However, this word can easily be implying we have to pray for the strength to escape. But I believe it's important to note the context isn't discussing our physical strength. No, rather it's discussing our spiritual strength. Please consider the verses leading up to the text. Luke 21, 34. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Notice it says, like a trap. The word for trap here can also be translated as snare. In other words, when it's time to flee, it's time to flee. There will come a time when we see the sign of Jerusalem being surrounded with the abomination that causes desolation and will need to flee the Babylonian system. Will, you have the strength, the ability to let the things of this world go? All the nice things you have, remember, they're just things. Will you allow these things to ensnare and trap you? Or will you have the strength to leave it all behind? Don't forget what Yeshua said. Luke 9.23 Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? Will you have the strength to flee? It will be at that moment. You'll find out if you have the things or if the things have you. Do you pray the prayer of escape as instructed by Yeshua? We pray you consider this carefully. Well, that's all I have. Think about it. Pray about it. But more than anything, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Until next time, Shalom. 